Welcome to the Empowered Curiosity Podcast. Today I am doing something brand new. I don't have just one guest on today. I've got three wonderful guests on. And these three folks are in the current cohort of Business Alchemist Mentorship. And as I sat down and thought about, oh, I really want to do an entire episode about the Tao of Business, I have had so many rich conversations with the members of this cohort of BAM that I just put it out there and was like, hey, does anybody want to come on and and share what DAO means to you, what the DAO of business means to you? And so we've got Brittany Soleil, Angela Queen, Cecily Saylor, and I'm so, so excited for all three of you to share your perspectives because I think... I can have my own interpretation of Tao and then the expression is so different in each individual, right? And so I really want this to be a space that we get to to share what our own individual expressions look and feel like and how it's, how it's changed little pieces of your life so far. So welcome on. Thank you. Mm. (laughs) Good to be here. Wonderful. So I think I will start just by na- trying my best to name Dell, which is a very unnameable thing, just mm-hmm. to get our audience kind of up to date. And then I'll invite the three of you to add and share um, what your interpretations of just the word Dell is to begin. So I want to start out by saying that the direct translations of Dell is something along the lines of purpose, of path, and line one, chapter one of the Tao Te Ching, which is where a lot of this philosophy comes from, names that the Tao that can be named is not actually the Tao. And so we struggle with actually putting a name to this thing because I think it's actually a felt somatic experience of, I feel in alignment with who I am, and where my life is supposed to be going and how I want to express myself versus I feel out of alignment. And so that's my sort of, I guess, 10 second way to try to explain this like very, very unnameable, almost intangible thing. So I want to just open it up and see if the three of you have anything to add to that. Mm. I love how you are saying that it's hard to describe, like you can't really describe it. And it's kind of like the best things in life are that way, right? Like love, what is love, all that kind of stuff. So um, for me, I think of the Tao as like, like when I'm in my Tao, it's like an embodied experience. It kind of feels like life is unfolding moment to moment with this sense of like ease and effortlessness and knowing and magic. Mm -hmm. so yeah it's just this sense of being in flow um with yourself and with life and with the people around you um yeah Yeah. and just so that the audience gets a chance to sort of get acquainted to our different voices that was just Brittany who was speaking so (laughs) Angela or Cecily do you have anything to add to that piece It makes me think of, this is Cecily, it makes me think of the hermit card in the tarot and you see this figure walking a path. They're usually in like cold mountains wearing a cape and they're carrying a lantern and the Tao makes me think of that lantern and the, the thinking around the hermit is that the hermit has removed themselves from the rigors and mm, hustle and bustle of everyday life to sort of separate and be with themselves or be with spirit and the that separation and that container they've created that singular journey allows them to tap into this wisdom and it's that wisdom that's lighting the lantern and you know the lantern will show you what's immediately ahead of you but it will not show you 
where you fully end up or the final destination or any of that, but it takes you, you know, as Brittany's saying, to the next thing and the next thing that's part of your your path, as you said, Kat. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. That was Cecily. That was her beautiful voice that just came in. Yeah, that was a beautiful description. And um, I keep picking up on this word path. And originally I was thinking of the path is clear, but it's not always clear. What I think the Tao does is that when a branch or something is in your way in the path, is it, it gives you um, the guide to know whether to walk past it, to step over it, or to sit there for a moment and, and play with that twig or whatever. Um, because you have that vision of your Tao, you know what, what that path is about. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I, mm-hmm. I really enjoyed both of what you guys had to say. Oh, that's so beautiful, Angela. And what I'm, I don't know, what I'm absolutely just like feeling almost like vibrating about is each of you have shared different interpretations of the Tao and all of them are right. And that's kind of the slippery nature of Tao. And that's why I think for me personally, I will just spend my entire life, I think, trying to understand this one word concept. Um, And you guys have just brought in a lot more nuance for me in this conversation already. So thank you. (laughs) Um, I think I want to give folks a bit of context for why we spend so much time talking about the Tao in Business Alchemist Mentorship, because each of you had a chance to go through a one-on-one guided meditation with me. And we came to a singular word for each of you your Tao and also your not Tao. And so I'm curious if you would be willing to share if it feels too tender, that's okay too. But if you'd be willing to share what your Tao is, what your not Tao is and how like looking back into your history, how that Tao, not Tao tension has, you know, threaded its way through your life. I can speak to that. This is Cecily again. I This was a really interesting and beautiful process. And I so I'm in BAM now. I don't know if Angela and Brittany have done BAM before or if this is their first time, but this is my first time. And so at this point, at the point we're recording, we're about, I think, three months into the program. And I feel like just this meditation (laughs) and this experience was worth like the whole (laughs) investment. Um, It was such a beautiful experience and it was really interesting going into it because of course your brain wants to predict like, what's it going to be, you know, is it going to be, and for me, I thought, will it be maybe transformation? Will it be community? Will it be creativity? And my Tao turned out to be magic, which was, uh, but like what I like to think of, this is a term people use in, in writing, the inevitable surprise, which uh, is used to describe like the ending of a story where whatever happens is both surprising and inevitable. And this felt like that to me, that magic has already been a big part of what my work is about. I started in this business as a tarot reader and blended that with... Um, the art of storytelling and writing, which has been a part of my background for since I was a kid and was really associated with a lot of the work I was doing when I did work nine to five. And so I, I've blended these two things together and magic has increasingly become a bigger and bigger part of the way I practice the enhancement of my life and also what I try to offer other people Uh through my work. And, um, for me, it maybe it's helpful to say what the not Tao is for me, which was overarchingly the word hopelessness, um, this sense of you know not knowing a direction, feeling really lost, not knowing why you're here, not seeing a way out. Um, and then associated with that are 
I was thinking the words for me are isolation or aloneness and it makes I think I never could have charted those feel like two points on the end of a spectrum when you think about this Tao framework and I don't think I could have used my brain to isolate those two words in connection with all of this like the meditation really organically brought them out and um, in terms of the opposition to the Tao or the not Tao the um, a big part of my journey was through much of my adulthood struggling with alcohol addiction and which was very much especially in the latter stages of that about hopelessness and mm. feeling incredibly stuck very purposeless numb isolated alone all of that and there really was I think a spiritual intervention in my life that finally helped me um, make a change and from that all kinds of magic began to happen for me in my life and more and more I began to work with that more intentionally and really lean into that as part of my recovery and healing and recovery of myself as mm -hmm. what I might be here to do or you know going from like lost hopeless purposeless or very confused about my purpose to uh, an incredible amount of clarity around that and the difference in the feeling of that is immeasurable it's like just amazing so yeah. um, that felt come doing the meditation and coming to that really felt like um, every so many steps or perhaps even every experience of my life sort of contributed to the creation or the formation of the revelation of my Tao they like they all figure into the spectrum I guess yeah. if that makes sense yeah and I think you bring in this really beautiful point that I love talking about which is like the Tao and the not Tao are two sides of the same coin and in order for us to actually understand what our Tao is we have all done the journey of the not Tao you know for you it was in that hopelessness space and kind of that that hero's arc the heroine's arc is to move through those shadowy dark spaces that have been so incredibly painful and also integrate it so that we actually see that all that pain was a part of it and it's a part of us and so we can't really I don't know divorce ourselves from that part like we have to understand and we have to integrate those parts of ourselves to bring them forth in order to have a full understanding of what the Tao is because a lot of the Tao is actually formed by those times in your life where you felt really lonely and helpless and hopeless so thank you so much for sharing that that piece of your story appreciate it i think too when we're in our not doubt it gives us um, a sense of like compassion and empathy as well um towards ourselves and towards others so there's definitely value in that mm -hmm. um i agree with you cicely i think that Tao meditation was um pretty incredible and I had no idea what to expect. Um, I mean, I knew that a word was associated with it. So I was like, okay, somehow we're going to you know, find the word. Um, and I was both um, surprised and also, you know, when I think about it, not surprised, right? Um, and for me, it feels like kind of this compass, like this, this direction um, to kind of be in that, that flow, that, that sense of my word. Um, and, um, I use my Tao in my personal life. I'll, well, I'll say what my word is. My word was awe. And so I kind of use it in two different ways when it comes to my business. It's like, if I'm feeling a sense of awe that feels like I'm in my Tao, but also, um, I think my Tao, the, my business is here to inspire a sense of awe too. So I kind of use it in, in two different ways there. And, you know, when I look back in my life and, but specifically my business, 
the best times are when I didn't know what was happening, right? But I was like in the moment and awe to me is just like taking a step back and being like, whoa, this is incredible. And just like kind of letting things unfold and just be in the, the joy and the amazement of it. And so there's this like, this sense of like, you can't kind of control. And I think Angela, you touched on it too when you were talking about the Dow, it's like, there's no destination, right? You're just kind of like taking it step by step and like taking a break and playing here and, and moving on. Um, so yeah, and I think my not Dow is kind of funny and <laughs> because when I was doing my meditation with Kat, I had a laugh. My not Dow is called the pattern and it's really this inside joke that I've had for 20 years with my best friend. When we are stuck in like our conditioning, whether it's our religious upbringing or the culture, or we're like just ruminating on things need to be a certain way and we just like can't break out of it. And so we kind of call each other out. And we're like, I think you're in the pattern right now. You kind of keep saying the same question. You keep saying the same things. So it's like this sense of being like really constricted and the world feels like really, really small. Um, and there's this sense of trying to control it all as well too, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think that that's one of the places where in business we can get so stuck, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. is when you're being told, this is what your business should look like. This is the template that you need to follow. This is the markers of success that society has laid upon each of us and when we can step out of that pattern and ask ourselves you know what does my soul actually want to do yeah you know and how does my soul want to express and be fed in this lifetime mm -hmm. that changes the trajectory of your business it has to you know yeah, yeah it's really freeing coin Sorry, say that again. I think you can coin that term, the pattern, being stuck in the pattern. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to teach yeah. my, um, I'm going to teach my um, partner about that so that they can observe those aspects of me and say, oh, you're in the pattern. <laughs> I love that. Um, I'd like to begin with my not Tao because something was coming up for me in that um, the journey of the not Tao or the the path, um, and I felt feel like I've lived the vast majority of my life in the not Tao, and it brought in so much loneliness and isolation, and I realized that I needed to become my full self, that I was isolating myself from others and experiencing that loneliness because around others I couldn't be my full self. I tended to be what they wanted me to be. So it became easier to be isolated and that contributed to this deep sense of loneliness. And my Tao is community. So as I learned that, but combine that with my knowledge of like recognizing safe spaces and what that feels like in my body. Like once I experienced a safe space for the first time, it's like that combined with community has been um, life changing really because it allowed me to be myself within these communities that I felt were safe inherently. And that's how BAM is that it's such a safe community to be yourself and to honor each other and it has so much respect so you're able to expand on your Tao you learn your Tao and then you expand on that little at a time in just the right way uh -huh. really it's it's been I love how BAM is slow and intentional uh -huh. because normally I would like to just eat up all the information I don't integrate it, and now I'm learning how to integrate mm -hmm. um, the information that I'm learning through that lens of the elements, which I love, and to slowly bring to bring in my Tao and expand on it as mm -hmm. it's comfortable for me, mm -hmm. um, and as I'm learning, relearning myself within these spaces. 
So it's been, you can't have one without the other. You can't have your Tao without the not Tao. And like you said, Brittany, there's that empathy that you've created, that you've you felt that compassion for people because you've experienced that. Like I've experienced isolation and loneliness by my own accord. I did that to myself. You know, I chose to be alone because it was easier than being in groups of people that I didn't resonate with. But now I've learned and built the confidence to be in the communities that um, nourish me and to eventually in time grow those communities myself mm -hmm. and um, the Tao really gives me that lens to make wise choices with my personal life in my business but it doesn't always have to be your business like I'm learning that too that it um, I can use my Tao within just my personal life and my friendships and my hobbies mm -hmm. you know the things that I love doing and then um, but it gives me that lens, that filter of like, okay, does this work or does this not work? Um, because if it doesn't nourish that Tao, then it might not be, it's could be a good choice for someone else, but not for me. Yeah. yeah. So much and, wisdom. <laughs> and Angela, I've had the opportunity and the privilege of, of being in a coaching relationship with you for a while now, a little bit longer than Brittany and Cecily. And what I've, noticed in you is the bravery and how you write your own permission slips now because I remember how lonely you felt when we first started working together and how like that deep craving of community was just always 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 there and so um Cecily what was that term that you said the inevitable surprise like, yeah the inevitable surprise like so when we came upon your Tao Angela like to me that's what it felt mm -hmm. like it's like yeah, of course her doubt is community. Like, of course this is it, you know? And what I've really been so excited to like, like watch you bring into your life is, um, the reclamation of spaces that you previously thought weren't for you, you know, mm -hmm. your background in being an indigenous woman and, you know, feeling a little bit like outside and yet inside of that group and wanting to really be in those spaces, you know, I've been watching you as you've been participating in more and more community events in there and writing a book. And it's just been such a fun thing to watch you just sit in that reclamation. Yeah, I think that it's um, helped me to move through fear rather than make excuses, um, I am able to say, okay, this is, this is scary, but it is a, a step towards your goal. Mm -hmm. It is a step towards reclaiming that community that you're looking for. So it's a worthy thing to, to, um, move past that fear. And like you said, the inevitable surprise. Um, I love that a couple term years now. <laughs> ago, I, <laughs> yeah, a couple years ago, I actually bought a book that's community is the title. Um, and he just goes through like helpful ways to build community, what community looks like. And, you know, I just fell in love with that book. So it has been, a, it has been part of my life. It's just, I didn't know how like I didn't have the bridge to get there mm -hmm. in the language. Um, and as I said, the, the confidence mm -hmm. to move in that direction. Yeah. I am sort of being brought back to, um, one of the meditations that I did for somebody else in our BAM group. And as soon as we landed on her word, she was like, God damn it. <laughs> Can't it just be an easy word like play or excitement? And um, I just want to like see what it feels like to land with your word. And if it's if it's actually been a bit of an activating space for you, um, because I know that for a lot of us, I, I can say this for sure. 
um, my Tao is surrender. And I've talked about this a lot on the podcast, my Tao is surrender and my not Tao is control. And so like for me to actually surrender, even though it feels like, as you said, Brittany, you know, the, the path sort of, it like opens up with ease. Mm -hmm. It doesn't always feel easeful to live in your Tao. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I just want to like, see what, what it's been like for you all in terms of the activation point around Tao. Yeah, I was kind of, well, Angela was talking, I was thinking about how when you're living in your Tao, it really requires vulnerability. <sighs> and it's not, um, it's not the path that most people take with business. And it requires you to be really honest with where you're at. And, you know, I mean, I can hustle. I can work hard. I come from a family of generations of entrepreneurs and we can get things done. And so trying to do it this other way feels really uncomfortable at times. And I think with my word awe, sometimes there feels like there's this sense of like, it's not enough just to be in awe. <laughs> like I got to do something here. So I think it's like just constantly reminding myself that um, just to like be compassionate with myself, to be slow. Um, there isn't necessarily a destination in all of this or a goal. It's just to check in with myself daily, maybe even hourly sometimes when I'm, you know, in the thick of it and just ask myself, can I, can I feel a sense of awe in this moment? Like, where's the awe in this moment? Mm -hmm. So it's definitely uncomfortable at times, but it's also really hard and uncomfortable in the not doubt. So, you know, it's like, which hard yeah. do you want to do? Yeah. And I think that like, I've even taken some of your work because in a previous conversation, Brittany, you and I have had, um, I think it might've even been in one of the, the BAM group calls but you were like, can I find a sense of awe in just making breakfast mm, yeah. and sitting down and eating breakfast with these people that I love? Yeah. And, you know, these mundane things that come up in our lives because we all need to eat breakfast. We all need to sit down and have a meal with the people we love. And it can sometimes become just this like rote thing. Mm -hmm. But can we infuse that moment with your doubt, with your sense of awe like yeah. that? I've been pulling that into my life as well um, mm. since you shared that in group a few weeks mm. ago. So yeah, I think that there's like a tangible way. It's not just this like, ah, oh, here's a word and I have yeah. to like live by the word. It's like, how do we make that practical? Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. I was not upset by my Dow. Um, <laughs> I was very excited part of me makes me part of me wonders if my conscious mind swooped in to get myself a word I wanted I don't I don't I felt very I felt very expanded through the entire process but I think the challenge for me with magic as a Tao it's something that I preach and try to make very practical for people um, and accessible and I think it's something I've always been interested and allured by I loved reading ghost stories when I was a kid I had a tarot deck for 20 years but never used it because I thought you needed to be psychic or have a grandmother or some elder witch come and teach you how it worked and magic is much more accessible it's accessible to everyone it's accessible right now um but i think this and, and i really try to just not even necessarily always talk about it in terms of like here come come do magic but more here's a practice you can do for your creativity for um self-reflection and baked into that as i create it is you know by the time they've done it i i feel they have moved through a kind of magical process but as someone like you Brittany I have hustled a lot I used to work in nonprofits where 
having a side hustle was almost essential for me to keep, you know, living afford- living in Austin, Texas. And so I was always, you know, in nonprofits, probably in many jobs, you do so, you wear so many hats, you do so much work, you're not per- very well compensated. And then I would be doing a side hustle of some kind. I'm a Capricorn sun, Capricorn moon, Taurus rising. So all this earth that just loves to uh, get things done, take action, see results, build things. And I tell my clients and try to offer them the experience of, you know, what if magic can take you 40, 60, 80% of the way toward your goal and action is actually, action is important, but it isn't, we don't have to live by the to-do list and, you know, wake up and go to that and let it run our lives. Like there's other energy and, um, that wants to collaborate with us and, and bring us the things that we're aspiring to. And so the challenge for me is to actually practice that and not go running to my to-do list and to make more time for the magic that I want to make in my life too, through ritual and other kinds of things. So I, it's really like practicing what I preach and really, you know, invoking more magic in the way that I do things rather than just taking the concrete pragmatic actions that I think are necessary to keep, you know, the business thriving or my life thriving. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I felt like, this is Angela, um, I felt like community to some aspect was contradictory to my personality because I am introverted. But what I learned is that I can have community and be an introvert and who, um, who's going to be part of that community and connecting with like-minded people and learning more about myself so that I can present myself in a way that's authentic to um, my community and let them know, let them decide if they resonate with me or not, right? And so as I became more of myself through this process, then the right people are coming around and, and they're saying, oh, me too, oh, I believe that too, or I, I think about that also, and um, they're connecting with me. So it's like as I'm growing into this and learning how to, um, visualize my life through that community, then I'm growing and attracting the right people. Um, but yeah, it was like, how is, like, is community, like, I'm going to be around a lot of people or socializing, like, what does that actually look like? You know, because it, you might think, oh, well, it's like lots of people and stuff. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to be around a lot of people. But really the community is, um, those that accept me for who I am mm-hmm. and I, I'm able to accept them and love them unconditionally for who they are mm-hmm. and there's that mutual respect and resonance um, mm-hmm. and I'm learning also how to honor myself and my own needs through that process when before I would um, give in to what other people needed from me or wanted from me I'm learning to advocate for myself in order to create these um, communities that feel comfortable and safe and alive and exciting and intentional and deep. I thought I was um, abnormal because I love deep one-on-one conversation, but, you know, as I open myself up to that, then I'm finding other women and men who, you know, love deep one-on-one conversation and small groups and intentionality and um yeah so it's really a beautiful kind of um blossoming and opening up that i am excited to experience for years that i know it's not just a a one time or it's just going to happen within months that it's going to be this evolution Mm -hmm. for years to come um, and that's where it becomes so life changing. Yeah, yeah. I think that something I want to highlight in both what you were sharing, Angela, and what what Cecily was just sharing before, 
is this idea of like resonance and magnetism and attraction by just being who you are you know I think that as you were speaking Cecily like the I because you were talking about creativity and that's when I've felt sort of in my flow of you know surrender which is my doubt but then also that's how I access magic is when I can just sit in front of a blank page and play with watercolors and it does feel like there's almost this like co-creative attraction between me and the universe just wanting to play like there's a very playful sort of energy with it and it can be with me and the muses it can be with me and the universe in what you were sharing Angela it's like between you and other people because as you pull off the layers of conditioning as you pull off the pieces that are the pattern then what's left is just you you know and when you allow yourself to be seen as just you and when you allow yourself to just sink into the juiciness of just you then that's where you know magic community surrender you know that's where all these beautiful Tao words come in and um, I'm actually thinking about creating a list of everyone's Tao words because um, as I was doing these Tao meditations with people I, I'd ask you know hey Cecily like what does magic mean to you and it would be this almost like the thesaurus of words that just gets encapsulated by the word magic it's like it means you know creation it means beauty it means like all these different aspects I don't know if those were the exact words that you used but I'm just using you as an example but like there were these all these beautiful aspects and like magic is kind of like the 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 seed in the middle of all those little roots that come off and so I'm thinking about just as a resource for BAM members um, putting together a list of everyone's doubt words everyone's not doubt words because it's this like undefinable thing so let's see if we can try our best to define it while also recognize that we can't define it and what does our community say about Tao you know it's almost like a like a directory do you need do you need awe do you need community like here's who you go to do you need to learn about surrender I know that's not what you mean that's my Capricorn like, oh, let's make it. <laughs> let's like, organize it. <laughs> yes. Sorry. I love how you mention um, being seen, and that has been um, one of the greatest parts of my journey the last three years, ever like since the pandemic started, is when I've started doing a lot of this healing work. And it was in these safe spaces that you become seen, you know, when um, the collaborators, the group, you know, offers that safetyness and that co-regulation. And it's a slow process I've learned though, you know, um, that what's slow based on what you need on what you're able to, how much you're able to be seen and how long you're able and it inches through as you're comfortable and then once you start to really feel into that and feel that safety in your body then it, it, it you just grow and now it's like I, I seek out um, those safe spaces and I immediately know when it doesn't feel well mostly I immediately know when it doesn't feel safe because yeah. of the embodiment work that we've done and to yeah. know okay this doesn't feel aligned with me and I need to find a way to you know exit from this and you know the best way possible yeah and it doesn't have to be this like well fuck this I'm leaving sort of a way it can just be you know oh that doesn't resonate with me I'm just mm -hmm. gonna step away it doesn't have to yeah. be this like dramatic thing which is I think what I used to do when I was younger okay. is this doesn't feel safe and fuck these people and I'm getting out of here as like a way to self-protect and I think that 
as we become more regulated humans. And this is one of the reasons why I think these like really fast business programs, like I, I wonder how it works because, I mean, I've taken them before and safety is slow. Like safety is a relationship. Safety is something that we can't rush. And so, you know, you're sticking a bunch of people who don't know each other talking about really vulnerable things. There's so much vulnerability that comes up as we talk about entrepreneurship because it touches on, you know, codependency. It touches on your relationship to resources. It touches on, you know, your ability to be seen and heard, like perfectionism, imposter syndrome, like all these pieces that I think are just so tender and you put it all into like one big mixing pot, one big group when everybody else has their own stuff too. And it's like, how can you expect to create safety in a 12 week container? For example, like there's a reason why I think I needed the nine months as the facilitator of this group is because I didn't want to rush the process. Um, and I think like when we place our priorities on on these, these deeper, more, deeper, more meaningful, like values, like safety, like purpose, like, um, community, then the only inevitable answer is like, we need to create a container that actually meets that. Um, mm -hmm. and for me, like the length of time that, that I want to be working with people is not just short term, quick fixes for me, it's like, let's build a relationship and that requires time and that requires a sense of safety on both sides. Yeah. And I think it's not always, um, a guarantee as well. I, uh, was part of a group called, uh, it was a decolonizing wellness group and it was a 14 month anti-racism, um, group where we really, um, looked at the wellness community and one of the community bylines was creating a safer space so she didn't use safe space because there's no way to complete like to make a 100% safe space Absolutely. and we're all kind of doing our best and have that intention and hopefully we create a safe enough space where we can share when we get triggered or something comes up um because I think yeah it's like like you said Kat like you know, to blow it all up and like, I'm done with this. Like, I didn't feel good. But then you can miss like what attracted you to that in the first place uh -huh. and kind of use that as a place to like dive in a little bit and, and, uh -huh. and kind of deconstruct. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I am feeling drawn because as soon as I start talking about safety, my brain goes to like binary spaces because I think mm -hmm. that like when we're not feeling safe, we have a tendency to go into like this or that, you know, like, wanting to simplify things and wanting things to be, you know, I'm either in my doubt or I'm in my not doubt and something that got brought up in Team Co-Create's call. Um, I just want to give credit to Brian Wingate who, who brought this up and it's something that I'm going to continue to teach now is think of the Tao and not Tao existing on a spectrum and having it be a dial. Mm -hmm. And so if you are in a space where it's like the Tao is activating you and you feel like, oh, I'm in a space of, you know, maybe not a hundred percent living my Tao, you know, giving your, yourself a chance to pause and, and look within and be like, okay, so am I like 51% in surrender? Um, and like 49% in control, which is like way better than where I was a year ago when I was like in 80% control and 20% surrender, you know, even just having that context of like, I'm in 51% surrender. And that means that I am actually stepping towards my Tao and that's good enough. And if in an activated states that that's the best I can do, then that's perfect. That's exactly what's meant to be. Um, and so I just want to like 
throw that out at you and see see how that resonates and if you want to add to any of that. I really like that and it's bringing to mind for me like taking the spectrum and turning it into a circle and I'll so like with magic for example you know you begin with an intention and whatever your expression of magic or your way of working with it or enacting it you're calling in something that you desire and something that you aren't currently familiar with experiencing whether it's a relationship or a new living environment or a like you know relate relationships whatever the case and and I'm kind of experiencing this right now where then the magic works <laughs> and it shows up and you the thing is here and available to you and then and this is something that BAM is really good at uh, emphasizing and preparing us for but when the magical thing arrives then for me often and I think for other people there's first the reaction of like oh wow this works and and it's like look at how not just like I'm so powerful I made this happen but look how much power is available when I dream or when I desire something or when I really get clear about my intention or and my desire so there's that kind of like oh my god there's a lot of power in this and then there's this new it's like this wall bursts open and you get to move into this new experience or kind of jump into this new timeline and then it's like who me like am I capable of this am I up for this mm. can I handle this can I receive this and then you kind of t I would tip back into like the isolation or the like not total hopelessness but just like uh, overwhelm of receiving this and then I have to come back to be like well this is what <laughs> I wanted with the magic and what is it like to stay in the magic of the entire process from desiring something wanting to grow in a certain way creating a kind of ritual around it patiently waiting to see what happens and then the the payoff i put air quotes around that because it sounds kind of capitalist to me but um and then you know having expanding yourself to be in that new reality i guess um yeah. and so like you're back in this loop where you have to sort of re-encounter the hopelessness or the aloneness or like can I handle all of this and you feel like I'm supposed to do it myself mm -hmm. it's like no you're doing this with the universe you have a you're doing this with community you're doing this with people so um, yeah. that came to mind for me yeah and I love that what you're naming here is the dysregulation that can happen when the thing that you've been wanting actually happens you know mm. it's almost like like when the dog's been chasing its tail for so long and it finally catches its tail and is like, well, what am I supposed to do with this now? <laughs> you know? And I can remember a very, very tangible moment. And this is, you know, one of the reasons why I'm seeking to create safer spaces for entrepreneurs is I was in a business program. One of the goals of that business program was to get everyone to a 10 K month. You know, I fell for a lot of those marketing tactics that a lot of people fall for. And I actually got to my 10 K month in that program and I felt so dysregulated around it because a, like, like you were saying, I finally got this thing, you know, I, do I have the capacity? Am I allowed to receive this? All those types of questions. And then I had everyone around me, like congratulating me and being like, oh my gosh, Kat, like you're doing such a good job, which felt like no one's meeting me in my dysregulation, you know, mm -hmm. nobody's like, and not that like, I needed someone to be like, Oh, like, this is so hard for you. But like, like I needed somebody to be like, Hey, like, how is this landing for you? You know, is this bringing up anything for you? And for me, it was bringing up a lot. And I ended up, I cannot tell you where that $10,000 went. I spent $10,000 in a single month because I was in such dysregulation around it and didn't understand how to receive 10 K that um, even when I did get it, I couldn't hang on to it. Mm. 
And so this is one of the things that I think as we're, you know, moving through these layers and we're getting the things that we dream about, you know, like you're getting those dream clients and you're able to hit your financial goals, whatever they are, you're able to launch your programs, you're able to create these really beautiful offers and they're doing really well. You know, I want to make sure that we are able to meet potential dysregulations that come up in that space and hold you and ask really important questions in that space. Because, you know, when we're just looking at the external and we're just congratulating the external without realizing that actually there can be some dysregulation that comes up as people, you know, level up, um, air quotes, because that also sounds capitalistic. <laughs> um, and, uh, like, I think that's where we can create safer, more regenerative businesses, more sustainable practices. Um, because, you know, if y'all hit your financial goals, like I want you to be able to do that in a conscious way and spend that money in a conscious way rather than what I did, which is like, I blew 10 grand in a month cause I had no idea what to do with it. So yeah, thanks for, for mentioning the like dysregulation that comes up when when you catch your tail. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was just so really grateful for um, how in BAM, we really started with the nervous system and really, you know, one of the things, Kat, you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, with this idea of being in the binary, like when we find ourselves in the binary, then we're more than likely in a stress response. And yeah. so it's just been a really great tool to kind of like check in with myself. And again, it's a practice, right? This is all a practice. We're not meant to be in the Tao 100% of the time um, or, you know, in a relaxed state 100% of the time. It's just in that noticing of like, oh, I am in either or thinking right now. And how can I you know, give myself some self-compassion and um, regulate my nervous system so I can like open myself up to possibilities and perhaps seeing this in a different way. Mm -hmm. So that was such a, a rich, rich lesson in BAM. Mm. Yeah. And that can be so subtle, right? Yeah. Like, I'm catching myself this week for whatever reason being like kind of irritated with my partner. Um, and like, not for anything he's doing like at all but he'll sometimes like smile at me and, and I'll ask him, I'm like, are you laughing at me right now? <laughs> and like the only two options are he's like neutral or laughing at me. And, um, I noticed that this morning and I was like, I've been saying that a lot lately. And he's like, yeah, what's going on? And we were able to just sort of like have a bit of a check-in conversation about my nervous system. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, it can be just as subtle as, you know, that, like I, usually don't see my partner as being a threatening presence, you know, <laughs> who's laughing at me. And it was just in these really subtle layers where, I don't know, like we're trying on a new dietary shift and it's brought up some feelings about food for me. And so there's just a little bit of an edge that my nervous system is just not equipped to dealing with this week. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that having the the either or and being able to shift it to like both and thinking um, is such a helpful way to move through the world and for me it's like it requires me to slow down and pause you know it's like if I go into sympathetic binary state then it's a check-in for me it's not a thing where it's like I put that on my, my husband to like fix about himself you know yeah that's one, been one of my greatest tools. Like, I love it um, because, and I remind myself that when you're in this state, pushing through isn't going to serve you well. That when you can regulate yourself again, you know, like come back to yourself, you know, think about what is the threat that you're feeling in those aspects, then you're able to think creative, creatively. You know, then you're able to really look at the nuances and um, 
come up with a creative solution, you know, and get back to that excitement. Um, so it's worth it to take that pause, yeah. you know, that it's worth the 10, 15, 20, an hour, like, or the next day, like yeah. it's worth it because ultimately you're going to see a better solution and the work that you do is going to, um, be more exciting and, and, um, you know, light you up more than just kind of muscling through because it's something that has to be done. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I have a question for you, Brittany and Angela, um, just because I think when I was envisioning working with the Dow, I'm not somebody who plans on having children, but I do want to like impact the next generation in some capacity. So I'm curious about how understanding your Tao and being in relationship with your Tao has shifted or changed how you parent? Mm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think it has for me in a couple different ways. You know, one, just being like, when you're a parent, and I'm sure it's like this, you know, I, I my son's almost 14 months old and you know the first few months you're just kind of like in this total daze right but then it's like all of a sudden he starts moving and it's like you got to do all of these things like i am constantly in like okay we got to get the snack we got to change his diaper we got to it's just like in this really repetitive pattern right i feel like sometimes parenting can be very much in this like just try to like survive another day. <laughs> and so I think remembering my Tao as an awe, it's like, again, like Kat was saying, like, how can I bring this sense of awe in the diaper changing, in the getting his oatmeal <laughs> ready, in the, you know, him like taking forever to, you know, walk, you know, to the car or whatever it is. And so it's, it's just a constant practice as it is with everything else. And ultimately, like, I want my son Obrin to like live in his Tao and I can teach him all of these things, but the best thing for me to do is to live in mine and be an example for him. And so that is the like reminder and like, I can get caught up in like, well, I need to hustle. I need to create this business and work really hard, but like, no, like I want to live this life of awe and purpose so that he has that full permission at such a young age to do that for himself. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's really, it's, it's been pretty trans transformational in, in mm -hmm. the parenting world for sure. Mm -hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I've said this before, but, um, Brittany's husband, Chris, is one of my dear friends from grad school. And, you know, I, I look at little Obi's life and I'm like, man, I wish I had had, you know, I love my parents. Absolutely would not, you know, um, change them for any aspect of their work. But like, like I think about kids nowadays who are growing up with really conscious parents, you know, or a conscious parent. Um, and you know, how that's going to shape the next generation just makes me so lit up and excited. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, we need more, more conscious parents. Angela, how about you? I feel like I have a few different ways. The first thing that comes to mind, just like specifically community is thinking about what type of community I want around my children. And um, because they're always watching and parenting has changed me so much, especially as they've gotten older and I've watched their development because I see that they're watching and I mm -hmm. like hear comment, you know, now they're like saying stuff that makes you, you're like, oh, okay, they're picking up on this, you know, so then you can start making adjustments. So they're going to see the community like that I'm around, um, you know, of course. 
you know, the community I want to invite in are those that love children and can respect children and treat my children the way that they should be treated, you know, yeah. and with respect. Um, so that's the, the main part of it. And then there's the aspect of the not Tao and how I've had to have compassion and forgiveness and kind of reparent myself through the years that I spent not living in that purpose because of fear. And as I reparent myself, like, you know, it's, it, it, it like moves into my parenting style and my compassion for them. And, um, Kat, you said this before in our coaching, um, you know, especially around my, my challenge with playing, like I have a hard time with playing. And as I'm reparenting myself and, and offering myself forgiveness, I'm trying to think of the right words. Um, that medicine is in there for them. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm able to recognize things and go to them and say, hey, I'm sorry that I did this, or I'm not great at playing. Can you help me learn how to play? And then that aspect of recognizing that the Tao isn't, there's no end point, that this is a journey and that it's all wrapped up in my life of entrepreneurship and my personal life. And there's no end point, literally. So I can work for a certain amount of time throughout the day, but I can cut that off and spend time playing, learning to play with my children because I'm in for this journey, like I've committed to it, you know, I've, ex I've become excited about it. So I don't have to push through these capitalistic systems. I don't have to like keep pushing through to get to this end point because it's all wrapped up into one. And part of that is playing with my children. Part of that is showing them the joy of living, um, in your purpose and helping them discover themselves. So as I discover myself, I'm learning how to help them discover themselves. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't know that I could have said it any better, but you know, just to highlight a piece of both of your shares is, you know, I think that a lot of times when we're learning about business, it's like, like almost like you have to put on a separate hat. Like for a lot of people, you grow up wearing a different outfit, even to go to work, a work outfit, you know? And, um, I've heard often things like you can't have emotions in your business. You have to put, you know, you almost have to fracture this part of yourself in order to show up and be a quote unquote successful entrepreneur. And what I'm hearing in both of your shares is the beauty of letting the edges get messy. You know, you might not necessarily see that direct connection between Angela, you learning how to play with your kids and asking your kids for help and learning how to play. I totally relate to that. I struggle with play too. And I'm asking my nieces and nephews all the time, like, you know, can you show me how to play this game? I don't know this game. Um, and you might not see that direct correlation between play and, you know, your business and your work, but the threads are all there because the work around Tao is mycelial, you know, it's mm -hmm. like beneath the surface and it's these threads of interconnection that I think we need to foster, not cut off even more in our culture. Um, so, I think that's the last thing that I want to say. I want to open up the space and see if there's any other little pieces that you guys want to share that are like, you know, your juicy little nuggets to, to leave our listeners with. Yeah. I just, I think what you said, Kat was beautiful and how there's this sense of what's coming to me is just like living our life in the Tao is really, we have to let go. We have to let go and connect. It's not like we're not trying to connect. It's like when I teach meditation, I often say that like to learn, you know, meditation, it's kind of the opposite of everything else you've ever done. It's like, you don't try to meditate. You just sit 
and allow the process to be. And um, so I think I 100% agree with you. I think that was beautifully said. I do love that concept of the mycelial network around this and want to chime in maybe as a a person who has also elected to not have children um which is it's been its own journey but i'm reminded of a conversation i had with someone yesterday during a tarot reading and the woman was talking a bit about some of the really toxic dynamics in the family in her family of origin and you know i brought up this notion of being a pattern breaker and um you know that that you know karmically perhaps her family had been playing out these dynamics for a long time and here she was really trying to orient herself in a different way and i after mentioning the pattern breaker thing she asked this question that i thought was really important she said well how do i think about pattern breaking if i'm not like continuing the line of my family you know she's 50 and and wasn't having her own children either and you know i thought I think it's beautiful what Brittany and Angela both shared about bringing your Tao into your parenting style, into the way that you parent yourself, into the way that you parent your children, in in the way you just exist, like by by virtue of every day trying more and more to be in your Tao. There's some you know energy that reverberates in everyone around you even if you're not like explicitly teaching your child what <laughs> your Tao is or what Tao <laughs> means and all of that, it's like this energy that um, people sense, even if they're not fully aware of what they're picking up on at the time. But um, I thought this woman's question was really important, you know, like, yeah, so if I'm, if I'm not passing things on down the line, what pattern breaking am I doing? And you know, I'm someone who's sort of in the same position where it's like, I, I've broken a pattern of alcoholism in my family. I've broken a pattern of, um, you know, maybe like being codependent with other people around resources and sort of staying in relationships or like, I I won't go into, I'm talking too much already. I think the point I want to make is just also by virtue of being in your Tao, like, I have a, there's a sixth grader that I mentor once a week and I see her for 30 minutes during her lunch period. And my boyfriend has a daughter who's 11 years old and whether or not there's children in your lives, all of the the people around you and in your environment um, are impacted by the patterns that you're breaking. Just the fact that you're not carrying those patterns forward. And I think when we, I'm trying to connect maybe two disparate things here, but I do think that when we're aware of a sense of Tao and trying to be cognizant of that, that the impact um, just reverberates in any environment and community that we move through. And um, whether you're breaking the pattern in your family, it's still sort of being broken in the fact that you're not carrying that energy into every other place that you travel. And um, that's just what came to mind. I'm sorry if that was a very long winded (laughs) rumination on that. No, like I um, love it because you know, I, I didn't realize I had like sort of taken people who don't have children out of the conversation, including myself, you know, <laughs> like I've also chosen to not have children and absolutely, you know, we walk around with the essence of our Tao and, you know, walk around with this connection that we have to our Tao and it inspires everyone that we come into contact with, even if they're not going to be our own blood children that we parent. You know, I think it sounds like you are at least in a, you know, a parenting team role with your partner's 11 year old. I am auntie to so many kids and, you know, I, I don't want to diminish those roles because those, those roles are, just as important um, for the little humans that are coming up in this world. You know, parents are not the only pieces of the community that kids need to be learning from. So I, I really 
appreciate you, you threading these, as you said, like two disparate places and, and bringing it all into this really lovely way of asking this question of how can I be a pattern breaker, even if I don't have children? And the mm -hmm. answer is you are, of course, a pattern breaker, regardless of what your you know, role with children is. Yeah, I agree that um, bringing that into the collective and the ripple effect that these, um, um, breaking these patterns, you know, and reflecting and, and being out into the community and the collective in a very authentic way, in a healthy way, that it just creates this ripple effect and um, influences other people who, you know, will influence their own children and as I said before, it's I, ha I, I'm observant of who I'm allowing around my children and, and what they're going to see from all the adults, you know, because that is my job right now, that they're not able to decide who they're going to be with. So I'm in charge of that. And um, so I'm, I'm very thoughtful of like, what are the adults saying? Um, you know, especially in this time when this, yeah, political climate. Um, so yeah, I appreciate that from all of my community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, my dears, this was such a lovely and juicy and I know this conversation just felt really grounded to me. So I appreciate mm -hmm. the energy that the three of you brought into this space. As we continue our journey in BAM, we're only, I think you said, Cecily, it's three months in. I lose track of time. We just finished up our metal module, so we're about two, three months in. Um, so I can't, can, I can't wait to see what happens as y'all continue on this nine-month journey with me. And um, thank you so much for sharing your perspectives and your stories today. Thank you, Kat. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you and for helping us find our Tao. Yeah. yeah. Such an honor and a privilege. Um, mm -hmm. But before we log off, I would love to just open up the space so that y'all can share where people can find you and your beautiful work. So, Cecily, why don't you go first? Thank you. Yeah, my business is called Typewriter Tarot. You can find it at typewritertarot.com. I offer creative coaching tarot readings. I have a membership program where we share rituals and practices weekly. I also share a free practice every week, uh, creative practice, creative magic practice um, in my weekly emails. And I'm on Instagram at typewriter tarot as well. Perfect. Angela, how can people find you? I'm on Instagram at a dawn locklear. That's a dot D-A-W-N Locklear, L-O-C-K-L-E-A-R. Um, and I do social media and digital marketing through a conscious lens. Perfect. And you also have a book coming out. And I have a book coming out. Um, <laughs> herbal. <laughs> I know, it's so exciting. Um, it's still surreal that it's even happening. So, um, But it's Native American Herbalism for Beginners, and that comes out January 3rd. Perfect. And Brittany? I have um, two websites. One is BrittanySoleil.com and the other one is FedByTheSun.com. Um, that's where more people who are in Portland looking for food. And I'm also on Instagram, Brittany um, hyphen Soleil. Um, I have a free um, or donation based weekly meditation set that I do over Zoom. So if anyone is interested, um, please contact me. I'd love to sit with you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much to the three of you, and I will see you in group ceremony soon. <laughs>